As we start looking at what we call production and cost theory, that is, what are the laws that dictate how much a firm can produce, what constraints do they operate under, the number one assumption that we make in this is the law of, law of eventually diminishing marginal returns. That's a mouthful, I even had a hard time with it, but it is important that we remember that we remember all of those parts of the term. Oftentimes we'll drop maybe the eventually and we'll just say law of diminishing marginal returns, but it's important that you at least always keep the eventually in mind. Eventually, you'll know why. It is an assumption, and it's the assumption that really forms the basis for what we call production theory, that is, how is it that we can produce more and more and more, which then in turn influences how we see cost theory. How much does it cost us to produce more and more and more? You'll see that these two are pretty much um, two sides of the same coin. There's no real different conclusions um, between production theory and cost theory, but we can't put production theory on the same graph with revenue, therefore we need cost theory so we can put it on the same graph to draw conclusions about profit. That'll make more sense later, I promise. When we talk about the law of eventually diminishing marginal returns, it's important to keep in mind this is a short-run assumption. In the long run, there is no such a, there's no idea of the law of eventually diminishing marginal returns. Instead there, we hear about an idea called diseconomies of scale, but that's something that we'll look at in the future. So what this theory gets to is saying that at first, so this is before the eventually. So at first, as we add variable inputs, typically we'll talk about something like labor because it's an easy example, but it really could be anything. As we add variable inputs to the fixed inputs, so remember, when we talk about the short run, it means there has to be some amount of fixed inputs. So given those fixed inputs, we keep putting in more and more variable inputs, and at first, we'll see increasing marginal production, average production, and total production. And all of those happen at the same time and together. Well, why does that occur? Well, let's, let's make an example and see if we can't work our way through this. Say that we've got three people, uh, or we've got one person trying to do all the jobs to, uh, to make cupcakes. You know, they, they bake the cupcakes, they put the frosting on the cupcakes, they go buy the, uh, the ingredients at the store, they market the cupcakes, cakes, they sell to the consumers, etc., etc. Well, because they're doing everything all at once, they lose a lot of time switching between tasks. When I go from making cupcakes to going and marketing the cupcakes, I've got to go change out of my dirty baking clothes and into a nice suit and go talk to potential customers. When I um, switch from frosting the cupcakes to baking the cupcakes, I've got to get out all this equipment and I've got to put away all that equipment. So one key thing about adding variable inputs, so in this case, my fixed input would be maybe the size of my, my bakery. It's going to be just a set amount of space. But I've got plenty of room to bring in more workers. So, some of those workers probably are better at some of those jobs than I am anyway. Maybe they're better marketers, maybe they're better advertisers. They're definitely better bakers because I'm horrible. Okay, so they may have better skills. It also is going to save me a lot of time in switching tasks, going from one task to the other. That time I lost switching tasks, if I'm just constantly doing the same task, I don't lose that time. Also, by doing the same thing more and more and more, I get really good at that one job. Now, maybe that's not a whole lot different than skills. I guess the difference between these two is this is more acquired and that's just more natural. So in this case, what's happening is that as I add the variable inputs, it's enhancing the production of the fixed input. So imagine if I have a big bakery and it's just me sitting in it. Well, I have all this space, but I, you know, I don't need that much space, right? I'm, I'm not that big a guy. So the fixed input isn't really being used to its maximum until I start to add more and more and more people. Now, again, just be careful here because we often will talk about people being the variable input. It doesn't have to be that way. Imagine I need a bunch of holes dug. 
and I've got three guys and that's all the workers I can find. I can't find any more workers anywhere. So I've got my three workers, they're my fixed input. They're digging with their hands and I add one, two, three shovels. So the shovels are now my variable input and obviously my production's gonna go up and up and up with each one of those shovels that's added. What about if I add a fourth shovel? Well, okay, maybe a shovel breaks and I save some time going to the store, but a fifth and a sixth and a seventh and a hundred shovels. Now these guys can't even work because there's so many shovels out there. So keep in mind that the variable input, though we often will use labor, really it could be anything. That being said, fixed inputs tend to be land, they tend to be management, anything that's going to be associated with a contract. Eventually, this enhancement that I was speaking of here is going to run out. And what we're going to see is that by adding more variable inputs, it's going to decrease first the marginal production, then later, some later point, the average production, and then maybe at some point the total production. I have that lined out because to be honest, probably we're never actually going to get there, but in the theory it does actually occur. But in real life, we probably wouldn't approach this. Probably once this starts to decline, we would stop adding the variable inputs. So what's happening here? So again, this is after the eventually, so now we're seeing diminishing marginal. Keep in mind, this is from one worker or one change of the fixed input, sorry, from one change of the variable input to the next. So what's happening here? Well, what's happening is that we're running out of something, maybe space. Again, if we go back to my bakery and say it's the size of my classroom, and if you're not in my class, well, you don't know how, that, how big that is, but you could probably have five or six people working in here pretty comfortably. Once you got past that, you'd start to get people getting in each other's way, bumping into each other, you know, just, just getting in each other's way. Also, you might run out of specialties. You've got one person who's really good at baking and that helps. What if you bring in a second person who's really good at baking? You know that old saying, too many cooks spoil the stew? Sometimes that can be a problem. Everybody has their own best way of doing it, and they spend so much time arguing over the best way to, to do it that they end up not really doing it in a very good way at all. That gets a bit more conceptual, so it's probably best to just think about, you know, in the size of my room, you know, we're gonna get to a point where, you know, 50, 100 people, you literally couldn't move anymore. So certainly there wouldn't be very much production going on. So in this case, what we can say is that the variable inputs are overwhelming the fixed input. And at this point, if I've got 50 bakers in my room, that's no good. So now what I need to do is I need to change my fixed input. Remember though, the second we start to talk about changing all of the inputs, including the fixed inputs, that's a long run or planning stage part of the discussion. Any questions or comments, leave them below.